Thank you for coming. Welcome to Made Land, which is the seventh week in the Buell's Conversations on Architecture and Land in and Out of the Americas, uh, with Anya Bizet and Deepa Raswami in response by Ivan Hall Martin. Uh, my name is Lucia Lais. I'm the director of the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia. Uh, this series, I'll just say a little bit about the series. It started about two years ago um, to showcase the work of scholars and thinkers and designers whose work helps to clarify the implication of land and our We kind of all know that there is an implication. Uh, we just felt it needed clarification, even for our own sake. And the plural Americas in the title is intended to complicate the mission of the center in two ways. First, by reminding us all that American architecture is exists in hemispheric and global relation with the rest of the world. And secondly, that there's always, to remind us that there's always several Americas in the United States. Um, and I want to just make a brief comment also for all of our Zoom uh, attendees that today we're reminded of the weight of this globality by the fact that access to this quaint 19th century brick building up three flights of stairs is being restricted by a security operation and apparatus which has everything to do with land, which lies an ocean and a sea away. And that uh, this has in part, therefore, made multiple Americas in this, in, um, on this campus and indeed transformed the campus a little bit into an image of the violence that is taking place in this time far away. So um, I want to be mindful of that, but we're lucky that we um, have a Zoom set up so people can attend even if they don't have the prized CUID. And, and, and also if there are urgencies that require people to not attend academic events in these moments, that they can watch it later. And that the work that we do in some ways contributes to uh, thinking through these issues. So before I introduce our speakers, I'm gonna do a bit of publicity. Um, um, season three, this is season three <laughs> of, of our uh, land series, um, it will have, three episodes and one very special anniversary episode. Um, the next episode will be taking us in Chicago. In come, uh, it'll, you'll also be able to see it on Zoom. It'll be in uh, coordinate and collaboration with the University of Chicago, um, Luca Stonic and Anne-Marie Leon. Um, the one after that will be in the spring and that will be uh, Stella Nair and Caroline Murphy will talk to us about early modern infrastructure. And at the end of this month, we will have an anniversary slash launch slash toast Slash keynote event called Unsettling Land. And that will take place um, in Avery. The, the launch, there will be a work in progress talk by Timothy Hyde, uh, a keynote lecture by Joe Goldie. There will be a launch. The launch is of this book. This is the only example yet, uh, which brings together some of the conversations that have taken place in this forum over the last two years, along with some of the research that the Buell has been doing as well. Um, it's also part of an installation that we're doing at the Chicago Art Central Biennial. So we will launch it here since we can't all go to Chicago. Um, and then the toast will be to the 40th anniversary of the Buell Center, which you see flashing here. Uh, and in, that will be just a toast, but it will be in the presence of former directors, hopefully as many as possible. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. Now, now that I've done that, step out of the way. Um, here. So this year, and this is the first event in that, we turn our attention to the political economy of land. Um, and this may seem a kind of obvious term, uh, but I think it's especially important in the disciplines of the built environment. Um, the critique of the political history of land is beginning to be folded into architecture, into architectural research, into architectural pedagogy. For example, even since we began this series, it's become much more common to hear in architecture schools, in studios, in seminars, that land is not, please come in, please. Land is not the kind of natural or endless resource that was promised to white settlers in the 19th century. Um, um, and so, as I said, the idea that we should critique land from a political perspective has easily, not easily, but uh, has done its work, let's say, in the discipline of the built environment. Um, but still, there are kind of secondhand assumptions that continue to be consumed as if it was sort of, sort of secondhand smoke. Um, in our academic disciplines, um, we continue to inherit many naturalizing myths that connect building to ground in all sorts of organized, organized ways. Think of the number of times you've heard about buildings making the land pay, or about buildings, uh, building idioms being somehow connected to or rooted in local or traditional building dwelling styles. 
And I think that these myths are largely inherited not from political ideology, but more fundamentally from the basic tenets of classical economic theory, namely, according to which liberty arises out of property and property is the result of mixing one's labor with soil. And, and in some ways, the goal of this semester is to try to untether um, the history of the built environment and the natural environment um, from that assumption that buildings magically grow out of the ground in the same way as you know, trees do. Um, so new economic historians have already begun this work. They're allowing us to imagine that capital is not a thing, but a process. And they appeal to environmental histories to do that. So they, they say, you know, after all, capital formation is not that different than, than uh, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis was already at work in making land a main thing. And I think that this means that this is wonderful, but we have a lot to contribute because we have better examples <laughs> than that one. So our speakers today are part of the young cohort or cohort of new uh, scholars who look at the built environment through the lens of environmental processes and of capitalist process and tell us even better stories than just saying that isn't capital formation kind of like such photosynthesis. So with that, and on a personal note, I just want to say that when I first was exposed to both Amiel and Deepa's work, in Deepa's case, I heard the talk at SH. In Amiel's case, thank you, Cassie, wherever you are, <laughs> for sending me your uh, written work. There's a kind of pleasure in reading work that really explicates how land and, and environment arise out of one another. And a few sentences in, you think, oh, no, I'm going to have to translate this into the built environment or into something. But then you don't, because by the end of the text, that too has come up. Um, and so that's it's just a real pleasure to read that. So um, without further ado, I'll do a very quick intro because our intros are on the website. So please just go to the website and read the bigger bios. Deepa Ramaswamy is an architect and historian who grew up in Mumbai. She's assistant professor of architecture and urbanism at the University of Houston. That's it. More to, more to see on our website. <laughs> and yet we say is an economic anthropologist whose work focuses on social and economic transformations at capitalist margins. She's assistant professor of anthropology at Cornell University. And Reinhold Martin, who has graciously accepted to be our respondent, is a historian of architecture, technology, and media. Professor of Architecture at GSAP, currently the chair of committees of Columbia's Committee on Global Thought. So without further ado, please help me welcome um, the, uh, Deepa and Amiya. Thank you for, uh, thank you to the Build Center, thank you to Lucia, to Reinhold, Michelle, for everyone who's involved. Um, I would like to say that this work is very recent, it's ongoing, um, and it's a privilege to present it here. Um, I would also like to say that the origin of this research is from a design studio, I thought, where the site was the coast of Mumbai. And um, when I looked at the maps that the students created, it was totally taken with, with like a palimpsest of land that was created by with such a deep history and still the same logic continued into neoliberal Mumbai. So uh, that's where it began. Um, so I'll begin. Mumbai is an island city built on reclaimed land from the sea. The city's coasts are the current sites of ongoing climate disasters, where occasional flooding occurrences have become nearly extreme events. These coasts are also the artifacts of prolonged land reclamations into the sea that began with the British colonial government's territorial expansionism and landscape transformation endeavors starting in the 17th century. Bombay, which is renamed Mumbai in 1995, was created from the sea by reclaiming land that bridged several islands in an archipelago. That's the going myth also. The map to the left is from 1843, so it was retroactively made. So after reclamation, etc., was done, um, they commissioned maps that kind of imagined what the islands would have looked. Map to the center is, was made in 1812, but the red dotted line was how much reclamation had already happened by 1891. And that is, of course, the current uh, uh, Google map of Mumbai to show this. Among the earliest inhabitants on these islands, on the western coast of India, were the Kolis, Bandaris, and Kunmis, who practiced small scale fishing and agriculture. The reclamation activities that bridged the archipelago followed a colonial vision of contiguous and measurable territory that could be a possible outpost and future port-oriented city of strategic importance for shipbuilding security. 
the infrastructural project of reclaiming large swaths of land also legitimized the British and East India Company's presence on the west coast of India to display control over land, labor, environment, and commodities. One of the first significant acts of reclamation in the archipelago was in 1710. Over the next two centuries, the British government and then the East, uh, East India Company, along with the support of local private reclamation companies, built causeways, embankments, dams, breaches, and infills. This is the one that was completed in 1784. By the middle of the 19th century, Bombay was a congested port city with reclamation as one of the profitable ways for the city's colonial government to create new land for sale. Bombay had completed two revenue surveys, one in 1827 and one in 1865, with the conversion of agricultural land into mill land, roads, and urban dwelling to accommodate an increase in population. These reclaimed lands were now visible sites where the British government and later East India Company built their ports, their factories, and railway lines that connected commodities, their cotton, to the factories in Lancashire and Manchester. These reclaimed lands were also the objects of transactions as territories for development and sale. I would like to really uh, pay attention to this. This was, uh, uh, it came in the Times in 1911. It was, I think, like an advertisement of their proposed reclamation. But I really like how they call it free land. They say the above sketch plan shows the great reclamation scheme at present under consideration at Bombay. The Bombay government proposes to reclaim from the sea the area shown on the right-hand side of the dot line of dots and dashes. The total area thus created will be 973 acres. The scheme is expected to pay for itself um, in, I think, 69 years. And the government will then enter into possession of a vast new estate free across. <laughs> a small portion of the scheme is already complete. The land is rocky and is only submerged at high water. Um, yeah. um, reclaiming land is risky business. Creating territory from the sea is an infrastructural, political, and economic move. Reclamation in the simplest terms means creating landforms from the sea by filling it with rocks, clay, soil, and dirt. It may mean raising the sea level by moving in dry earth or pumping out muddy water from shallow areas. It involves cutting across mangroves and hills and moving large amounts of soil and rock. Reclamation infrastructures can be read as strata. The layer of invisible storm water and sewage pipes, then the infilling of rock and mud, and lastly, the visible infrastructure that I showed before of the colonial city's built environment. In addition to being expensive and labor intensive, reclaimed lands were susceptible and prone to flooding and sinking, they still are. At different times, various actors from the British colonial machine described reclamation in Bombay as winning land from the sea, an epic struggle with the sea, an act of keeping the sea out, the project of stealing shallows from the sea. I found a recent one that said, chasing the sea out. Phrases that suggest an adversarial and warlike relationship with the sea. <clears throat> sea and land are ambiguously defined entities in the history of Mumbai. Reclaimed lands are the material artifacts of the city's archipelagic origins that emerge from these ambiguities of the crosshairs of infrastructure risk and speculation. In an island city where expansion into the water seems to be the chosen response to its primary scarcity land. These ambiguities have been weaponized for the promise of development predicated on land availability for the connection, circulation, and movement of people and things. Uh, so these are the quotes. Um, the famous, kind of famous, I knew most people in Bombay know about it, the contentious history of the dowry exchange of the islands before reclamation between the Portuguese and British in 1661 best explains these land sea ambiguities. As the story goes, the Portuguese gave the islands to the British crown as part of a marriage treaty between Charles II and Catherine of Braganza of Portugal. Legally speaking, when the Portuguese handed over these islands, they handed over all the, quote, rights, profits, territories, and appurtenances of Bombay. However, the core of their, quib core of their quibble between the powers was the question, how many of these islands actually constituted Bombay? So the Portuguese claimed there were four islands on the archipelago, one of them was named Bombay, and all they had to hand over to the British was what they call the island of Bombay. On the other hand, the British claimed two, then four, and later seven islands constituted Bombay. The differences between the two colonial powers emerged from a core contrast in their geographical conceptions of the archipelago. The Portuguese were more interested in the mainland and thought of the rest of the islands as a collection of distant, flooded territories, unsuitable for agriculture because there was brackish water. 
The idea to reclaim these islands only fully emerged after the British crown acquired them and handed them over to the East India Company as part of a royal charter in 1668, calling them the proprietors of the Porten Islands. These disputes between the Portuguese and the British were played out in multiple maps showing different number of islands to suit specific narratives. And um, I've mentioned this before that I found so many maps and I spent so much time trying to find seven islands in them. And it, it was a pointless exercise because <laughs> I read somewhere else that uh, when they map, it depended upon where you were when you mapped these islands. That's why they were so different because there was high tide, there was monsoon. Uh, so they said it depends on the vantage point. It may be sea one day and three months later after monsoon, it may be land. So that's why they are so different. Um, most notably, in some cases, the British argued that the areas that were routinely underwater during high tide, which the locals and Portuguese considered to be a part of the sea, was land, often qualified as overflown, drowned, or wasteland. This claim was supported by statements attributed to locals describing how, quote, during low tide, one can walk from one end of the island to the other. By claiming the sea as land, the British changed the terms of their transactions with the Portuguese and sowed the seeds of contiguous territory in place of an archipelago of distinct islands and communities. Historian Kim Riding, who has written about this, characterizes this discrepancy between land and sea as a deliberate misinterpretation as part of the allied past troubles of colonial give and take of territory. However, when analyzed through Pranabandar's research on colonial property law, this discrepancy is part of a deeper history of British appropriation of land through the distinction between waste land and cultivated land. Where cultivated land was integral to a linear progression, starting from a state of nature to a state of civilization. Territorial rights, rights over land stemmed from the settlement and cultivation of what was wasteland. Calling the sea a wasteland and reclaiming it to create territory for sale, ownership, transfer, and collateral complicates the colonial commodification of land settlement and occupation. In addition to being risky, reclamation was expensive. The British were conscious of the costs of the risks and the risks involved in reclaiming projects, considering that by the 19th century, landscape reclamation had helped construct the limits of cities in the United States and the Netherlands. Even, even as early as 1673, they commissioned a report on reclaiming activities in Bombay to the Council of Surat. The report stated that while reclamation was feasible, it needed to be seen that the Crown should leave it to the servants, freemen, or inhabitants to raise a common stock. This meant outsourcing the risk of reclamation to the East India Company or to local traders who could act as proxies willing to take, put in their own money and take the risk. And the, if the literature is littered with words like wasteland, overflown land, um, and um, uh, and that quote is where it talks about um, how about we ask somebody else to invest the money. Uh, <laughs> reclamation activities expanded to their full potential in the 19th century when the Bombay government started to rely on private reclamation companies, such as the Back Bay Reclamation Company and the Elphinstone Land and Press Company. Many of these companies operated at the intersection of profits from two colonial commodities, cotton and land, with transactions hinging on the prospect of creating developable land in the future. Profits from cotton were parked in reclamation activities. These companies were typically joint stock companies, just like the East India Company itself was. They were affiliated with banks and financial associations. The Elphinstone Land and Press Company, for example, was formed in 1859 by two brothers from Glasgow, John and James Nichols. And they had a transaction with the government where um, a Bombay government who said they gave 100 acres of reclaimed land to the Bombay government in return for reclamation rights for another 250 acres on which they built a dock and permanent wharf. That's how that was their terms of exchange. The capital for these projects came from selling shares to British and local merchants. The Bombay government built their railways on this, what they call free land. On the other hand, the Back Bay Reclamation Company was an example of local participation in the unregulated economy of colonial Bombay. The company was started by Gujarati and Parsi businessman Prem Chand Roychand and Koash Jangir in 1867. Roychand belonged to the Jain and Gujarati community, which had trading ties with Africa and Persia as part of pre-colonial global mercantile networks. He was already a successful broker in cotton, real estate, bullion exchange, loan security, stocks, and bills of exchange by 1867. Thanks to a turn with the start of the American Civil War in 1861, when the Southern American states could not send their cotton to English factories, turning to their colonies to maintain its supply. 
The cotton market suddenly boomed in Bombay as cotton from other parts of the Western coast was sold and sent to England from the city's ports. This unexpected jump in value and demand made both the British and local traders extremely rich. There were stories, this is a line I've seen in so many books by different authors, that local people were cutting into mattresses, pulling out the cotton and selling it in the market because of the, uh, they were making so much profit. Mm-hmm. Three years <laughs> after the start of the American Civil War, there were over 20 banks and financial institutions, eight land companies, over 20 insurance companies, and over 5,000 joint stock companies in Bombay, many of which were the product of local entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial activities. Businessmen like Roy Chan had understood that the unprecedented amount of local money floating in the city must be invested somewhere, and shares such as those of the Back Bay Reclamation Company were the answer. It was common for brokers such as Roy Chan to advocate for Back Bay shares to the customers at the banks he was on the boards of. The banks, in turn, would acquire shares in companies promoted by Roy Chan. There were several proposed reclamation projects on the anvil with acres of reclaimed land that were supposed to be available for sale. In 1864, Back Bay Reclamation won the rights to reclaim Bombay's western foreshore, consequently increasing its uh, its share prices. The story of Bombay's boom ended as abruptly as it started with the end of the American Civil War on May 1st, 1865, when Britain returned to the United States to get their cotton. Indian merchants, farmers, and traders stopped receiving enormous profits from cotton. This led to an economic crash in Bombay in 1865, where the stocks of Back Bay Reclamation Company crashed. While the British government rescued the British-owned Elphinstone Land and Press Company by buying their reclaimed land, the Back Bay Reclamation Company was bankrupted. Roy Chand and others never reclaimed the full extent of land as promised in their lifetimes. It was reclaimed in the 20th century. During the years of Bombay boom, Roy Chan and other merchants, brokers, and traders had started to meet under a banyan tree across the British-built neoclassical Bombay Town Hall to trade in bullion exchange stocks and shares. The banyan tree, or the Fight <laughs> Bengalis, is, is a native tree with a huge canopy and roots hanging from its branches. Under the tree, the group, along with Roy Chan, formed the beginnings of what would be recognized by the British as the Native Stock Brokers Association. It eventually uh, that building still exists. It's called the Asiatic Society, if you're ever in Bombay. And that is not the original banning tree. Um, that tree was memorialized and people write about it in books, but um, I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, the Native Stock Exchange Stock Brokers Association eventually became the BSC, the Bombay Stock Exchange, in 1875, with 318 members from the local business community. This was Asia's first and largest stock exchange, internationally recognized stock exchange that preceded the Tokyo Tokyo Stock Exchange by three years. That is the current BSE building. (laughs) Roy Chen and others bounced back after the reclamation debacle. He used some of his new wealth for philanthropy and to fund Bombay's Gothic building, Rajabai Clock Tower. That is the, that building still exists in Mumbai. The reclaimed lands acquired by the British from the bankrupt Elphinstone Land and Press Company became the Bombay Port Trust in 1873. The Bombay Port Trust was an autonomous corporate entity created by the British government to care for the city's ports in the 19th century that still exists and operates in Mumbai. Coming a full circle, the Bombay Port Trust recently opened these very lands that were reclaimed in the 19th century for the Eastern Waterfront Project, which is trying to mimic London's... um, Eastern Waterfront, which unsurprisingly proposes some more reclamation along the coast. Reclaimed land from the sea is a political, infrastructural, and speculative act that brings to light the local traders and business people in colonial Bombay who participated in the formation of the city. They have often remained at the fringes of the origin narrative of the city. Local traders and merchants like Roy Chan made profits by making alliances with the East India Company. But they also developed businesses, invested in infrastructure and philanthropy, absorbed colonial risk, and generated indigenous capital in a very unregulated economic environment. Reclaimed lands were the visible sites of transactions in the form of ports, factories, railway stations, and markets. They were also the objects of speculative transactions within colonial banking institutions, private reclamation companies, and under a banyan tree. They delineated the social stratifications and relationships of colonial society 
between British and East India Company officers, local merchants, traders and middlemen, residents of Bombay who moved from other parts of the region, and the older inhabitants of the archipelago who were suddenly drawn into colonial capitalist modes of accumulation, economies of land, ownership and private property. This paper does not cover other narratives of reclamation that, ties, um, that tie into these intersections, which are part of my broader research, histories of prolonged ecolo ecological damage, displacement, and the valorization of coastal land, coastal infrastructure, and sea views in Mumbai that extend into contemporary Mumbai. This is from a recent uh, report on reclamation in 2016. Reclamation remains integral to the island city's expansion. In the decades after India's liberalization in the 1990s, reclamation has doubly emerged as a crucial part of Mumbai's neoliberal growth blueprint. Since the 1990s, over 72 kilometers of land have been added to the city by reclaiming the intertidal zones. In 2021 alone, the city had over approximately seven kilometers of coastal land reclaimed from the sea. Geographer Adam Gridhart explains how the art of rec act of reclamation is not really about gaining lost ground. As the word reclaim suggests, it is more specifically about the construction of ground where water had once been. Gridder Hodge's description calls attention to the inherent ambiguity between land and sea that is embedded in the constitution of reclamation infrastructures and the history of Mumbai. But sometimes sea becomes land and other times land becomes sea. The ambiguity between what constitutes land and sea that marked the city's genesis in the 17th century is now more evident along Mumbai's coast which operate as static extensions of developable territory into the water, sinking and flooding with extreme weather patterns every monsoon season. Thank you so much. Yeah, please go ahead. Like once more? Yes. Yeah. One more? There yes. <laughs> Um, hi, it's hard act to follow. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Luchi and the Real Center and to Reinhold um, for having me and creating this opportunity to discuss this work, which is also sort of a mixture of very new and somewhat old. Um, I also wanted to say that what I'm going to be talking about is not unrelated to what's happening on campus today. And so I wanted to just um, kind of mentioned that the logics of settler colonialism and property um, kind of link the the securitization of campus with what's happening elsewhere. Um, and yeah, I'll come back to that a little bit. But um, okay, so Western Kenya. I <laughs> I have been doing research in Western Kenya for about a decade now, um, and I've been tracking de agrarianizing rural life, especially near major highways. Um, and something that's been happening there is that agricultural land is being converted into real estate um, in this kind of accelerating way. So there's a bunch of reasons for this, which I'm not really focusing on, but just quickly. So it's become very difficult to survive as a small scale farmer. Um, in Kenya and around the world under contemporary economic conditions. Um, the country is decentralizing in ways that have led to the growth of kind of regional capitals, um, which is also expanding them into rural areas. Um, and there's this sort of middle class aspirations to build houses in the country. And all of those things are, um, are yeah, creating this um, land process, which is quite similar to what's happening in urban peripheries, so maybe familiar to some of you. Um, and like that process, this more rural version often begins with the subdivision or partition of agricultural land. So I'm gonna focus on that partition um, and I'm gonna focus a little bit on what comes out after rural land has been subdivided, which is this unit that I'm describing as the plot, or which is described as the plot. And I wanna use the plot to unpack some of the weirdness of what's usually called subdivision. It's kind of in LA. Um, and this is a small piece of a bigger chapter that explores how plots as socially defined units facilitate lands extraction from agrarian social relations. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about size today. Um, first, by looking at the plot as a unit of measurement, a very weird unit of measurement, um, and second, by thinking historically about the politics of smallness. Okay, um, so during my research, I noticed that the word plot had come to mean something very specific and that it had land use implications as well as size implications. So the, plot, the, the term is an English term, but it's imported into Kiswahili and into other Kenyan languages. Um, and it encodes two things. People call a plot 
People call a piece of land a plot when that piece is A, intended for real estate development, and B, small. Um, so plot is defined in this kind of, what's the wrong? Yeah, it's defined in this kind of um, dialectical relationship with the word shamba, which means land or farm, uh, and links land and farm in that way. Um, so I first perceived this opposition between plot and shamba as actually an opposition to two different forms of measurement. So that was um, the acre and the plot. So in Gakwen, which is a place where I did research for a long time, it's a truck stop along Kenya's main east-west highway. I'd often ask about the land prices and I'd ask about, you know, so what, how much does this cost per, per acre? Um, and this didn't work as a question, right? So people kept saying back to me. Um, one friend said, as you get closer to the highway or to town, we don't talk about acres, we talk about plots. People want to sell in plots so they can make more money. I got the same response when I was acting, asking about the acre price of some fallow land for sale along the highway. Um, we are selling by the plots. And again, about land in a settlement scheme a little bit further down the road where I was told that the farms were initially two acres, but were, but were now being subdivided and resold as plots, in this case, quarter acre pieces. So calling the land a plot seemed to divest it of its agricultural meanings and advertise its availability for both property development and speculation. So land size and land use were shifting together. Okay, but even as the term plot had slides are totally off, but that's okay. Even as the term plot had size implications, these were imprecise. So unlike the acre, the plot was not a fixed measurement, and there was a lot of debate over how many plots were in an acre, or even whether the term carried a quantitative significance at all. It's very unclear. So for instance, in Nairobi, the term plot often just referred to a small piece of land with a building on it, or which could have a building on it. Um, in Kakamega, which is another part of Western Kenya, the term plot could be thought of as a unit of measure. Um, and it was usually described as a percentage of an acre, but the percentage varied. So sometimes I was told that an acre was four plots. Sometimes I was told that an acre was eight plots. In Nakuru, which is where the pictures that you're seeing are from, um, a friend told me that an acre was 10 plots. So a lot of variability. Um, in real estate marketing, and I just want to point out here that there are three different sides here advertising plots for sale, three different companies. Um, and one of them advertises 50 by 100, you can't see it at all. The other one advertises an eighth of an acre. So in real estate marketing, plot operated as a slightly more specific measure, um, although that measure also changed over time. So right now it refers to the smallest permitted subdivision um, which is a unit which is described in, in, interchangeably as either an eighth of an acre as, or as 50 feet by 100 feet. Um, so even in this somewhat more, more specific usage, there's still this weird indeterminacy to this unit, right? Because the slippage between length and area measurements meant that an eighth of an acre did not precisely align with 50 by 100 feet, even as they're used interchangeably. And this was then again complicated by the fact that on title deeds, um, land size is always represented in an area measure with hectare. So there's all of this kind of weird, um, weird translation gaps, which are exacerbated by the fact that, of course, land doesn't actually come in neat, you know, 50 by 100 parcels. <laughs> um, so the translation between different metrics, as well as the translation of, of the ground into mm -hmm. abstraction, caused a lot of confusion. And there's all kinds of explainer videos and threads online where people are like, wait, how many plots are actually in the <laughs> <How many plots? laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> so this is just one, one, one video. Um, this left room for a lot of wiggle and I think it's commercially significant. Uh, so one real estate agent told me like simultaneously that 50 by 100 was the smallest permitted subdivision and told me that a smaller piece, 40 by 80, <laughs> could be described as a small plot. <laughs> um, meanwhile, a quarter acre could be called two plots or it could be called a large plot. Um, formal real estate listings tend to distinguish between plot and parcel. This is sort of more real estate language. Um, rather than plot and shamba, right, which is that earlier word for farm or farmland, um, but again, in ways that are kind of more impressionistic than precise. So a parcel tended to refer to anything larger than an acre or an acre and above, but sometimes it describes something that was just under an acre. So I saw listings, for instance, that said that three quarters of an acre was also a parcel and not a plot. So I just had the sense, right, that somewhere between three quarters of an acre and a quarter of an acre, the thing turns into a plot. Right, it's, it stops feeling like 
agricultural land and starts feeling like something else. So I've been talking a lot about numbers and the weirdness of these numbers, but actually I think it's this feeling that is really one of the most important pieces of this. And so there's this, you know, there's this variability in the precise moment at which land becomes a plot and that has changed over time um, as you get smaller and smaller subdivisions. Um, but there also seems to be kind of broad agreement around the fact that there is a division, that we sort of broadly, we broadly feel together that at some point this stops being farmland and starts being real estate land or rather property development land. Um, so the land, the unit itself, the unit of plot is dialed into some kind of social sense around what makes land a certain kind of land. So this attunement and this variability are what I'm interested in here, and I want to use it, the question and narrative within which measurement tends inevitably towards increased standardization over time. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit um, by talking about Pitom Kula's book, Measures in Men. Um, so the story of measures over time um, takes more and less celebratory forms, but in most versions, modern measures are de described through kind of an idea of increased standardization, increased abstraction. So Vitil Kula's book is an example of this, but in its less celebratory form. And in it, he describes measures as once invested with social content and social meaning that is then lost with the advent of modern metrology and abstraction. So the book is really fascinating. I'm just going to illustrate with some example, with an example from the chapter on land measurements, since that's what we're talking about. Uh, so in contrast with today's abstract forms like the metric hectare or the imperial acre, traditional measures, Kula said, were located in the quote, realities of life and labor. So using, using examples from medieval and early modern Europe, Kula outlines two social ways, and this is his term social, social ways of measuring land by labor time and by amount of spending. So for example, in Bourges in the 18th century, a journée described the area that one person could plow in a day, right? Whereas a citré signified the area of land that could be sown by one citier of seed. And I don't know exactly what is one citier of seed, but some, you, you know, some container for seed, um, which was larger or smaller. So the citré could be larger or smaller depending on how fertile the soil was. So you need more or less seed depending on how, right? You need to sow more or less densely according to the fertility. So Kula points out that these measuring styles permit that the basic unit of land can be meaningfully attuned to people's daily lives and labors and to the quality of the land itself. And he makes the incisive point that equalization and standardization are not the same thing. Um, she says, quote, given their arithmetical inequality, indeed because of their arithmetical inequality, such measures are more homogenous with respect to their social and economic significance. So this seems to me really important and really right on because like any farmer knows that an acre of like sandy rocky soil is absolutely not the same as an acre of fertile well-watered soil no matter how much an acre is the same as an acre right um okay so i i find this all really compelling but i do want to push back against this rupture narrative that Kula, Kula writes through so a narrative around modernity as a process of alienation that is linked to standardization and abstraction doesn't actually help us to understand that the way the plot as a unit is attuned to the realities of the ground on the ground um, and is actually facilitating land dispossession in some way. So these realities on the ground include market conditions, but also this sort of right social variable sense, this feeling about what is desirable and appropriate for, for different uses. So put otherwise, to describe the intensified commodification of land through language of standardization and abstraction seems to me to miss something important about the way that this process is socially mediated. In the longer version of the of the this work, I show how that social sense becomes really relevant to land speculation and to the commodification of, of ancestral land, so land that hasn't actually been yet marketized. Um, but here, what I'm going to switch to talk about now is actually to talk a little bit more historically about how these feelings about land size are created, um, and I'm going to describe a key moment in the history of smallness. In yeah. Yeah. I forgot all the languages, which I always do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I right click, like I write here. <laughs> okay, land war. Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, two defining features of the plot are that it is small and that it is for property development. It's not an accident that these two things go together, um, nor is it an accident that subdivision is viewed as the decomposition of agricultural land. So I want to think about where the assumption that smaller pieces of land do not lend themselves to agricultural land use comes from. 
The spoiler alert is that it has a lot to do with settler colonialism. <laughs> um, norms around land were actively crafted during the colonial period as part of Kenya's land reform or land registration process. So I don't have time to talk about the full history of land reform, but I wanna give a little bit of context for those who are not familiar with Kenya as a settler colony. So colonial settlement in Kenya dispossessed indigenous populations of the land's most fertile agricultural land and resettled them onto so-called native reserves. Um, so for the bulk of the colonial period, non-white farmers were barred from growing the more lucrative cash crops like uh, tea and coffee, for instance, or pyrethrum. Uh, this policy was reversed shortly before independence, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but has a lot to do with the, um, the movement known as Mau Mau, but called the Land and Freedom Army, um, which is when the colonial government, under what's called the Swinerton Plan of 1954, the colonial government began to encourage native participation in cash crop production. So the plan argued that in order to intensify agriculture, people would need credit, Land was, of course, going to be the collateral for that credit. So in order for that to work, people needed title. This is a really familiar argument, I think, to many. Um, yes. So land reform thus actively commodified land by linking economic inclusion to the ability to hold title, to access credit, and to participate in market agriculture. Individual private title contrasted with the complex kinds of rights that characterized many local tenure systems. And so land reform was, for this reason, an effort to shift how agriculture was practiced and how land mediated intergenerational social obligations. Um, and imposing norms around land size was really key to this process. So this had to do with how colonial officials understood surplus accumulation to be tied to land accumulation. In their view, to be a productive farmer was necessarily to want more land. Um, so the plan explicitly links the registration of land to just possession. Um, okay, so in the past, government policy, this is from the Swinerton Plan, um, which is the name that's given to this longer title. In the past, government policy has been to maintain the tribal system of tenure so that all the people have had bits of land and to prevent the African from borrowing money against the security of his land. In future, Former government policy will be reversed and able, energetic, or rich Africans will be able to acquire more land and bad or poor farmers less, creating a landed and a landless class. This is a normal step in the evolution of a country. Um, so this document makes no bones about the fact that inclusion in the market is going to create inequality. Um, what I want to point out though is this term bits of land. My format again. But yeah, um, the previous policy was to keep people tethered to the land, right? That was the sort of made the reserve policies to keep people on the land. So no matter how small that connection is important, right? Um, for keeping people stable. Uh, but the new system is going to require people to have larger pieces of land and therefore it will require the dispossession of some by others. Since the question of redistributing settler land was not at all on the table. So the question of size becomes even more evident in related arguments about the need for consolidation. So land registration and land consolidation were completely went together in the process of land reform. Colonial agricultural officers had long been commenting on the problem of land fragmentation related to so-called native tenure systems. Inheritance, use effect, and grazing practices in many of the areas where settled agriculture was practiced resulted in these kind of dispersed and overlapping foldings. In, in particular, practices of partible inheritance, where all sons would inherit a piece of their father's land, unlike the British system, which was primogeniture, uh, meant that lineage land tended to get subdivided across generations, leading younger generations to seek land elsewhere. So this scattering of holdings, so people would have these kind of very, you know, we said, it's kind of these like uh, shocked statements about one family could have 26 different pieces of land, you know. So the scattering of holdings was considered by colonial agricultural officers to be inefficient and detrimental to soil quality, um, and also hard for them to survey. So to summarize the overwhelming idea that small is bad for agriculture, holdings should be of a size economic for the purpose for which they're required, brought about by consolidation of fragmented holdings or by enclosure of communal lands. The able African must not be debarred from acquiring and farming units in excess of any minimum laid down for the area. So this report, this minimum comes, comes in because the Swedish report is drawing on an idea which is circulating with, um, in agriculture economics at the time, which is that there is a minimum land size 
below which agriculture will be uneconomic. So you get this term uneconomic size, which, which circulates. Um, and so this fear of fear of fragmentation of us gets the, written into a binary of economic and uneconomic in which economic carries a sense of viable. When it comes to land, this report suggests more is better, but it's actually better to have none than too little. So in her work on land tenure reform in the central Kenyan highlands, highlands uh, Angela Kogarud questions the assumption that fragmentation is detrimental. She notes that distributing one's land in smaller pieces allowed people to farm across different ecological microzones, thereby maximizing their ability to endure climate events or crop failure in an area. So where the language of con consolidation implies that homogeneity and contiguity are just inherently beneficial, the social and ecological realities on the ground suggest that actually diversity was valued, such that fragmentation is not a challenge to overcome, right, but a value in itself. Um, and this value of fragmentation is explicitly articulated by indigenous cultivators. Oh, that's another slide. <laughs> um, in during the land commission in 1932, so actually 20 years even before the plan, Chief Ogata in Western Kenya rebuts colonial proposals around consolidation with the argument that the colonial government should actually be protecting the reserves from white encroachment. The reason we don't want registered titles to our land is that we go in for fragmentation of cultivation and our cattle graze far and wide. Government is our father, and if government sees the right to set a boundary, let it be a boundary between black and white. And there's another person who also uses this language of boundary and says, actually, there's a boundary written in our hearts. We don't need a boundary to understand our land. We need you to create a boundary between us and the settlers who are trying to take even more land. Um, so around questions of partable inheritance, right? So we, we again see that revising an understanding of land tenure and ownership actually tends to reframe partable inheritance less as a problem or a difficulty than as a strength. Um, so where the plan is deeply anxious about inheritance, um, crazy, yeah, sorry. Um, we can see here, right? They're very anxious immediately before inheritance has a chance of creating fragmentation, conditions must be created to ensure that subdivision does not take place below an economic level. Um, but legal scholar H.W. Okoth Ogendo actually reframes partable inheritance as a strength again, noting that it reflects the multi-generational obligations that are um, embedded in land, and that it is that there are these the practices of dispersal of land dispersal actually are kind of flexible way of responding to that. Um, so for Okoto Gendo, it's not fragmentation, but this liberal theory of ownership that's the problem. Okay, so across these conversations, we see that attitudes toward land size reflect and encode different understandings of what land is. Um, and this is a question that's been persuasively addressed by settler colonial mm -hmm. studies more generally. So just to come back to this um, title of the panel, Made Land, I want to, I just want to kind of emphasize that land reform really created land as property. Um, in these very specific ways and in ways that have clearly laid the groundwork for the more intensified commodification that's happening now. Um, and this making of land was also really successful in rewriting ideas about how agriculture should be practiced. So the idea that small is bad for agriculture is really hard to shake. Um, and my point is not to say, right, that small is good <laughs> necessarily, but just to think critically about how that, how that idea really operates in our minds, including mine, um, and it's important because I think because the sense that the division and dispersal of holdings can only be bad, can only be detrimental, that idea has filtered really uncritically into discussions around agrarian change in ways that one, reinscribe these colonial categories, but beyond that, I think they can actually facilitate the separation of people from their land, right? Because if somebody thinks that this land is too small, there's nothing I can do with it except um, sell it to a real estate developer, then I'll just do that. Um, and the specific language of an economic size continues to be taken up unproblematically in policy and academic conversations around land tenure. Um, and even actually Okoth Ogendo, who's this really critical legal scholar, adopts that term kind of un without any kind of comment in his um, in his work on colonialism and land tenure law. So I think this, you know, in addition to rewriting this, the viability and the meaning of land into this binary of economic and uneconomic, it also gives the impression that small pieces of land can only be suited for real estate development and implies that the problem is smallholder agriculture or inheritance patterns, right? So sort of social, social bads rather than the corporate and elite farms that are that continue to claim huge pieces of land across the country. Um, okay, so briefly concluding, um, it's clear, <laughs> I think, that uh, <laughs> 
that settler colonialism subtends what land has come to be in East Africa and elsewhere. Um, and I think that's certainly the case here in the United States. Um, and my colleague Paul Colby's work on plots and land defense in Palestine shows that um, these dynamics are also relevant to the terms in which struggle is being waged today. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, one just want this one last quote from Robert Nichols, who I think is really fantastic on land. But he says, you know, he writes that the making of territory into land, the making of land as property, is not just the story of everyone's domination by the commodity form. So it's also that. Um, but he says that it is a more specific story of dispossession. So he writes that generalized concerns with the commodification of land tend to ignore the extent to which this process has been subtended by systematic transfer of loss and group differentiation. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, um, both um, and Deepa, for these. Uh, you know, I mean, this we could just go straight to the question because I think there's so much to discuss and so many uh, kind of self-evident uh, uh, intersections and and so on. Uh, but I also, in, in the spirit of kind of opening things up a little more broadly to begin with, and then you know narrowing down, bringing this back down to the specifics of your talks. Um, I thank, again, Lucina and team uh, for convening this very constructive way to re revisit truly fundamental issues um, and for both of you for providing us with so much to think about together. Uh, and, you know, since the connections, I think, are self-evident, I'm not going to rehearse those. Instead, I'm just going to first and try to do this very briefly, just pose a series of general questions that I suspect are in everybody's mind in, so, in some way, you know, that are transferable from between these papers. Uh, and um, and then and then bring it back down to specifics that may help us synthesize some some relevant aspects uh, of, of these two fascinating and but the same time quite distinct studies. So that you know there's there's that balance. So on the problem of making, you know, making land and made land and so on, I want to ask, I think, with our colleagues, because you've done this, so I'm just repeating some things, you know, by whom, uh, for whom, and by what means. That seems to be uh, a critical kind of through line uh, through all of this. And putting it this way, I suspect that all of us here would acknowledge the usefulness of the kind of constructionism and the anti-foundationalism that this making, this way of thinking about making, implies without necessarily, we may not necessarily agree on the implications. Um, since to denaturalize something like land can, for example, help us demystify fiercely dur durable origin stories like the Bombay, you know, how many I was, um, by recasting land or territory or indeed the earth itself um, as what historians of science call it or have called an epistemic thing, a thing with which to think, a type of historical making that, you know, and I'm speaking of land in general, uh, in, in its constructedness, if not, um, if not its outright artificiality, uh, helps us uh, to construct and to understand the ways in which we know the world um, through the tools of the colonizer, for example, as I'm just pointed out, uh, to the extent that we can even make that thing stand in for an entire way of knowing. Like in other words, there's a metonymic dimension to the to the particulars that you've been uh, offering and ask what in is the epistemic regime uh, governed by this thing that we call land, right? In general, and then in these specific cases, you are you know, for example, with respect to coloniality, is is this the same ultimately uh, logic at work in these very different places, or or is it to be distinguished in some some at that at the level I'm, I'm, I'm asking? Obviously, historically, it's the same. Now, but to recognize something seemingly natural as constructed compels us further to ask in what way. And again, we've seen vividly answers to that. Um, and although I invite Emil and, and Deepa uh, to speak for themselves, this is, you know, on, on this, I suspect that neither of you, I don't know, would be entirely uncomfortable with the adverbial phrase socially constructed. So in, in other words, that it's not just constructed, it's socially constructed, right? And we, um, to describe their objects of study, but here too, we can seek some, we can just keep listing adverbs, you know. We can seek um, more adverbs and ask, for example, diachronically uh, and or synchronically over time or kind of simultaneous. Uh, again, I suspect that everybody here would answer along with our speakers, everybody in unison, both. Um, <laughs> but even so, 
um, you know, thereby reformulating our characterization as socially and historically, and again, I think you both demonstrated this, constructed, it, it a little bit retains the passive voice. So, um, so if anything, it heightens the curiosity of the listener slash reader, because I was the reader, I was the privileged reader to actually read the, the, the papers. Um, you know, who made this land? Who, in the end, who, who did this? Who made this land? Why and how? Or to put it in the present, that's the past tense, to put it in present tense, who makes this land? Why and how? So who's the, you know, subject of the sentence? Now, of course, both, as we again just heard, papers provide partial answers to such questions, both explicitly, but you know, also somewhat implicitly. Uh, and so that's what I think we, we, we can discuss more specifically res with respect to each. But just before that, I just want to pause one more time and, and attempt a rephrasing now in, in something like a more active voice. Um, since if making implies a maker, instrumentality of some kind seems to be involved, interests. And, um, in other words, interest, purpose, and reason in its sort of double sense, reason as you know, knowledge and, and, and technique, but also reason as purpose. Um, uh, alas, my own loyalties notwithstanding, the discursive regime that gave us the concept of epistemic things, which is, is something that I personally found a useful way to think about, about some of these things, has never been quite able to answer the question of regime change. Uh, in other words, uh, how do things change? How, how does this happen? How do these things arise? Um, uh, for example, how and why in a specific locale or in general, the regime of knowing that preceded land, uh, uh, however we may describe it, uh, you know, unenclosed, common, pre-modern, uh, even primordial, um, how, how, did, how did such a regime give way to the thing, you know, that we've seen the thing with, with which we're concerned. How did this happen? And to sharpen the point, whose lives were thereby enhanced and whose were ended in the process? Or more, more urgently, and to you know, join uh, the, the, in solidarity with the, 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 the voices raised uh, with respect to uh, current conflicts, um, more urgently again, if, if not yet though in the active voice, how might this regime called land be remade or, or made differently so that history's scales may be rebalanced. You see, I'm still speaking in a passive voice. Uh, may be rebalanced to support peaceful coexistence rather than more death. And finally, and more actively still, how to name the makers, those who made this land, hold them to account, uh, and begin the remaking. So, you know, I, it seems to me that there are you know, of these kind of questions in both of your talks. Now, I just, friend, so now we get to specifics and then it's all, all yours. Um, I, I just want to, I phrase these remarks in this way since both uh, um, Deepa's and Am Amiel's uh, papers seem to me to be animated, you know, by such concerns, uh, which does not mean that, uh, again, this is your call, each necessarily takes up the mode of activist scholarship directly. Um, rather, in, in each, though, we can glimpse the remaking of concepts uh, and of historical interpretation such that the current regime, you know, with which we're concerned, call it land, uh, seems less inevitable and more transformable. Uh, so, you know, in the spirit then of bringing this, so to speak, down to the ground, uh, here are my, this, this, you know, it's like a series of more specific questions uh, in each case. So I guess we'll go on the sequence of the presentation. But, you know, so for Deepa, I, 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 you know, I very much in, enjoyed your account of the making of Bombay uh, at its edges and from its around its original islands. And so my first question translate the details that you offer from which, you know, again, I learned a great deal. I too actually did a studio in, in Mumbai uh, at some point in the distant past. Um, into the into these terms that I've just kind of tried to sketch out. So, for example, this, I'll refer to page numbers for your benefit, but you're the because I have the PDF. Uh, beginning on page two, you suggest, then you read this out, you suggest that the ambiguities arising from Bombay slash Mumbai's uh, long history of territorial expansion into the sea, quote, have been weaponized for the promise of development predicated on land avail availability for the connection, circulation, and movement of people and things. So, you know, so predictably, now, I, I think I have, you say, I, I therefore ask weaponized by whom? In other words, 
Um, if you were to rephrase this, what reads a bit like a thesis statement, honestly, for sort of talk for the paper, um, a little more actively, who would be the subject of the sentence? I mean, it seems that the subject of this, that sentence changes uh, through the talk and maybe necessarily in acknowledgement of historical changes, you know, the ones who do the weaponizing. Uh, and then shifting somewhat away from the metaphorical weapons to maybe more literal ones, uh, what materially, as well as discursively, would be their weapons? You know, what is it, under what material conditions did, you know, what at times seem is the British and others, perhaps a, a comprador class of merchants and so on, um, do do the work that they do? And, in the, and then how might we specify in, in you know, this relation to which I, I just, I haven't, I have a, a way of kind of, I'm just trying this out. It's interesting because I'm learning about it. Uh, a kind of spatial hypothesis as, as a way to segue also into questions for Amiel. So as I have understood and come to understand Bombay's history, there has long been a function, I think it appeared in the 1911, you know, especially you showed the, the scheme, um, uh, a, long, a functional and symbolic difference between the Eastern and Western waterfronts. Uh, and, and until recently, I, and you know, as you say, the Eastern waterfront has been rather more industrial, which, as I recall, um, significant military holdings, is that right? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, whereas Bombay's Western waterfront, in addition to featuring substantial public space, uh, has, has long been associated with a certain kind of cosmopolitan glamour um, along Marine Drive, uh, and maybe more recently, I don't know how we characterize this, all the way up to Juhu, um, where the movie starts in the so, um, so if this is a reasonable characterization, how to explain the difference, which I'm, I'm suggesting is actually a topological one, uh, of a two-sidedness, both sides of the coin, if you like, in terms, these terms of the weaponization of land, both material and symbolic. So, you know, which interests, et cetera. Okay, and finally, um, again, I'll, I'll just say how much I appreciated your, your, your talk and your paper and how much I learned from it about a locale and historical situation with which I am notably less familiar. So forgive um, you know, the distance. Uh, but like others, I'm sure I was especially struck by this language of farms versus plots um, uh, in and around the Kuru, uh, which as I understand it is a fairly large town. You, I think you use both terms. We might call it also a city. Uh, is, is that right? About 300,000? It just became a city. Yeah, it officially became a city, yeah. So there's a whole US, <laughs> a UN discourse about like what is yeah. a city and yeah. who, who yeah. cities, or, you know, but also about what is it, roughly 80 miles outside of Nairobi, more or less, I mean, whatever, do the math, kilometers. Um, but ambigu ambiguities regarding, this is the point, ambiguities regarding smallness, smallness notwithstanding, this was actually, it was more of this in the paper, so for me, I just, you know, Responding to these details, um, I was equally struck by the mathematical exactitude in, in the proportions of the plots that you describe, which, if I'm correct, all seem, or at least the ones you describe, to adhere to a proportion of about one to two, 50 by 100, 40 by 80, and, and so I don't know, maybe it's a, a series. Uh, if so, why? <laughs> Um, and, and if this proportion is relatively consistent throughout, is there some sort of logic, you know, spatial or otherwise, to it? Um, does it, for example, this is what came into my mind, does it more easily enable further subdivision uh, into two adjacent squares, accommodating, for example, building on one side, yard on the other, or something like that? So, or if not, are there discernible topographical properties to these plots, uh, in addition, other, other properties to their plots in addition to their size? Um, I'm basically just layering in, trying to suggest, I, I'm sure you do this in the rest of your work, but other dimensions to, to uh, that size and, and to think about the interaction. Um, similarly, I was also struck that in one case, at least, otherwise identical plots, this was in the paper, um, in terms of size, acquire different values. I think this is the family where they were extended in a line and, mm -hmm. and it depended on, on the proximity to the highway. Where Mze Roberto's, if I'm saying that right, uh, land was located closer to the highway and therefore more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's a topological difference. That's a difference of, of adjacency, which is different than the, the topographical, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, shape uh, and size questions. Um, so finally, if if so, how to account for the highway? Uh, sounds like you do this, <laughs> and, you know, and other features of the extended landscape and all of this. Um, 
since I imagine that in this case, it, it inscribed in this, that, that particular small plot ultimately uh, at an infrastructural scale that included both Nakuru and Nairobi uh, to some extent, if, the, if it's the highway that's connecting them. Uh, and so in, in that sense, I'm, I'm speaking topologically, you know, rather as you do also just uh, towards the conclusion of your talk in, in terms of when you're discussing fragmentation versus uh, consolidation rather than in terms of size and shape. So of the of the inside outside properties and properties of adjacency and such. So finally, can we generalize in some degree? I don't know. Maybe this is asking too much about the social and economic, so as it were, laws of subdivision here at a topological uh, level as well as a topographic one. In other words, is the logic of plots, you know, perhaps topographically ambiguous for the reasons that you explain? You know, I think very very well. Uh, but topologically precise or, or lawful. Um, that is in term in terms of uh, you know in terms of what is inside, what is adjacent to what, to whom, and so on. Or in other words, um, to return to where we began, uh, socially and historically, right? That those adjacencies and those what I'm describing rather abstractly as topological relations actually it seems to me encode social and historical ones. So. Right. That's what I have asked, but it's all yours. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, that was again. I can begin. I wrote a lot. <laughs> I have to look. I think I would like to. Um, yeah, you spoke about the. Um, Yes, you spoke about the, the idea that there is no subject to the weaponization question, right? Oh, you, yeah. In the sense that who's weaponizing what and where did I write the weaponization? This is a problem with writing to my mouth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You kind of answer. Okay, so. I'm just going to answer what I think I heard at that point. So uh, about the question of, can I just say that when I wrote that sentence, I did think, should this be active or passive? Sorry. Because, <laughs> because, but I did but not, but if, be, but to answer your question, because I did ask that question, I am saying this is, that this ambiguity between land and sea has been weaponized over time. I really come from a very contemporary worldview because at this point, there's something called coastal regulation zones in Mumbai where they're doing exactly what colonial logic is still continuing, where um, they took some land in front of the sea, which first they labeled it uh, Bombay Municipal Corporation and the Coastal Regulation Zones recently uh, started naming shorelines as bays. And what this did is it changed the, the frontage that you have to leave from 500 to 200. So yes. you can actually build. And, you know, and again, when I saw that, and this, there's a lot written on this, that who decides what's a shoreline and what's a bay. And then I went into the CRZ, this is coastal regulations, where they say, oh, what is coastal land? It is that which is touched by water or that which is affected by water. And they keep changing these definitions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it seems like they want to define it, but yet they don't want to define it because, you know, yeah. so that is where the weaponization came. And I thought, during in colonial times, it's I mean colonial, the nineteenth century. It it's so difficult to pinpoint because it was first the British and then the East India Company. But through their mapping, through cartography, first I saw the transformation of land. First, you have the sea, which is shallow. We call it wasteland. We will make it. Re we'll reclaim it. We we'll call it reclaimed land. You have a revenue survey. You. Then it's land that is a private asset, right? East India Company has it. Then they also have this statement where you know you make it into smaller plots. Actually, that came up after you read your piece that we don't want to release too much land into the city because the price of land will be upset. So this whole transformation process, I think, was based on this vagueness or ambiguities, right, between identifying what is land and sea. We saw that, I saw that in the cartography. I later saw that again when um, uh, Premjan Reuchen and the other reclamation companies were trading on land that is going to be built in the future, right? It really doesn't matter it, if it was made, it was traded on and that money found its way back into the city in buildings, right? Raja Tower, which was oddly Gothic. So 
to answer your question, I don't, <laughs> I can't pinpoint, but it came from a very contemporary look at weaponization of um, yeah, sea and land and trying to define it, but all those definitions really don't mean anything. And with me also struggling with all those maps, trying to find seven islands, is this five, is this four, and really doesn't matter. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. Sure, good. And yeah. the second one, you spoke with the eastern and western yeah, yeah. waterfront. Um, yes, the western waterfront of Mumbai is was reclaimed earlier. It's the flashy marine drive where the rich people live, etc. And the eastern waterfront was the Port Authority, and that is the land that was reclaimed in the 19th century by reclamation companies that was purchased by the British and oddly released recently for redevelopment. And there's going to be a lot of displacement of all the people who live there. It is one of the poorest parts. Generally, I grew up in Mumbai and have never been to that area because it was completely walled in because both authority and defense secrets, etc. So you didn't actually see that part of Mumbai at all, even if you lived, maybe people who lived close by. So uh, I think the history of reclamation is also tied, Mumbai's history is tied to the way these two posts developed because the, the East, western coast was developed earlier it was opened out of the eastern coast was purchased by east india company uh, purchased by uh british government uh, bombay government at that point and then handed over to the port authority which held on to it until the early 2000s and released it out um i think hopefully one second yeah. yeah thank you um I have more questions for you too, but I have questions for you. Yeah, please. But um, I'll just I'll just quickly respond to a couple of the more specific points that you mentioned. Um, I, first of all, I just really like this idea of thinking kind of topographically, topologically, um, about adjacency and as well as about kind of size. Um, but in terms of this, you know, this uh, the this great question about the, the dimensions, right? Sort of too. And I would say that that's actually very helpful for me because one thing that you really see across all of the sort of marketing um, material about the plot, especially the, the one eighth of an acre plot where it's 50 by 100, is that it is always kind of aligned with the size of a three bedroom house. So this is clearly related to some kind of middle class, middle class aspiration about what kind of house you should build. And even there's a sort of sense that like everybody understands that this three bedroom house is about the same size. <laughs> and there's actually like tons and tons. You can buy like on a street in Nairobi, you can buy a little pamphlet that gives you instructions for building a three bedroom house, which is a very standardized kind of sense of what that is actually. Um, and so yes, yeah, so the, the three bedroom house, which takes up almost the whole size with a small kind of kitchen garden, small yard. Space for, or space for your car, which is actually yeah. more important than this case. Okay. Um, so absolutely, there is a link there that's really helpful to think to think about. Um, and then in terms of that, you know, you brought up this sort of these. these this is a, a family who has pieces of land arranged kind of from the highway down to the river. They're all the same size, but they have different values. And so this is a, a bigger question that I'm actually going to throw back out to everybody, which is. Um, that of course, you know, I, I'm I'm speaking against kind of standardization and abstraction as logics of as as necessarily logics of modernity. But of course, price is the kind of app the the like the the absolute abstraction which can actually bring in all of bring, bring in differences into itself and abstract them so clearly. And so in this case, you know, price becomes the is the logic by which you can really see. You know, okay, so an acre is not an acre, but you can see that price, that price nevertheless commensurates, commensurates all those differences. And so that this is one of the ways in which I've really actually been struggling with writing with what exactly I want to say about abstraction and alienation. Because I think I think on the one hand, I do think that there's something really important to pointing out that late capitalism is destandardizing. Like I think that that's interesting. On the other hand, it's not de it's not necessarily de-abstracting. Like we have actually an extreme, we we live. Um, we live in these, as Mark would say, these real abstractions, right? They are they are simultaneously social, socially mediated and abstract. Um, so, to come back to kind of your bigger question about the, the epistemic object of this land, which I think is really um, fascinating to think about, and I and I say less sort of socially constructed than socially mediated, mm -hmm. but also historically, I do think it's you know historically constructed, but not in contingent, not in purely yeah, contingent ways. Yes. Historically constructed in which they're really related to history's power. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so for me, the I mean the the question, the big question that I have, which comes back to your paper, Deepa, also is I. I do think about land, but I also think more generally about capital and ask this question about, you know, 
But how do we think about capital as an epistemic object? But also then to come back to another part of your question, right? Do we see it as the same everywhere? Um, clearly, land is not the same everywhere. But people tend to talk about capital more or less as the same everywhere, more so than other things. And so um, I was thinking in relation to your paper, right? You, I mean, we talked about this a little bit already, but you really see that there is a difference between imperial capital and indigenous capital. Those don't operate in exactly the same ways because the, cap, the company operating on indigenous capital can go bankrupt. The company operating with imperial capital does not get allowed to go bankrupt. And so I think, so for me, there's, yeah, just throwing that question back. They, that's what we think I'm thinking about. Very good. Yeah, All right. Wow. Questions have been posed to the audience. So. <laughs> um, I, I have, I'll start. Okay. Um, um, and it, maybe this is to loop back to your how is uh, how is land weaponized? Maybe it's more that land is turned first into a weapon in order for them to be able to weaponize land wherever. Um, it seemed to me that in both your cases you had. Uh, a prehistory of that value, so price. Um, you had a moment where that was not price because of juxtaposition or because of proximity, uh, as it would be in any other real estate situation, but because there was soil quality. So soil quality was the value that was being used, and it was in a moment. It was in passing, and I didn't. I wanted to hear more about that. And in your case, you also have this tree, which may or may not have been there. And it strikes me that that. In that differentiate plan from other forms of planities that are, yes, of course, subject and equalized to organization, whatever, and, and socially constructed, but where that construction has a referent, however distant in the past or however artificially constructed, which is somehow subject to natural contingencies. Mm -hmm. I mean, in your case, also, you have, you didn't talk about them, but environmental contingency, land, um, what do you call them? Sinking. Um, Hides, um, <laughs> you know, water going up and down. And in your case, at least fertility as an idea, which is somehow brought in. So I want to hear about that. How does that make your the case of the standardization or the case of the abstract capital different? And the simple way to say that: Can you talk more? Just talk more about the tree. Talk more about the fertility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, tree. The tree, I, I really don't know. I mean, it does not exist anymore, is what I found out. Um, but to come back to, I didn't take notes, about the, the, the question of value, right, with respect to uh, these reclaimed, um, to the question of reclaimed lands. So, so there is the first question of the transformation, of course, that, you know, you take, there is C, the sea is transformed into, you have the whole cartography, it becomes a private asset. Um, can you start? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still formulating, but because the tree is not related in any way to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's so many things to say about fertility. I feel, I also agree, it's really interesting. It's not something that I, that I, that I focus on that much, but I think that there's, I mean, a couple of things um, so one is that fertility was a, was a really important question for colonial, for colonial agricultural officers. Um, and that it was, to, to use a weaponization term, it was really weaponized against, um, kind of whatever you want to call it, indigenous tenure systems, which often argued that the form, that the specific form of grazing, because I haven't, I didn't talk that much about the a kind of broader picture of settlement process, but actually, you know, the, the idea that what pre-existed colonial settlement was like a lot of peasants farming in smallholder agricultural ways is actually not at all the case. What you had was much more kind of agro-pastoralist um, tenure formats, uh, as well as some settled agriculture, but much less settled agriculture, much more kind of semi-settled agriculture, which resembled in that way. So then that way, the kind of contrast between the colonial land logics and pre-colonial land logics, come back again to your question about regime change, right? It resembles just more what you see settler colonial studies really, really arguing for in the context of the United States, which is that what what land meant was 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 an incommensurable in some ways because had the way that it was used was um, so different from the sort of British British conceptualization of this scale farmer. So that said, so colonial, so in order to kind of so there's two processes, right? There's there's first the process of just settling 
And then there's a process of commodification. Um, and those happen to some extent together and to some extent separately. But land soil fertility is really used as, a, as an argument, a weapon against kind of semi-settled, against mobile transhuman patterns, which actually are better. I mean, many people clearly say these are ecologically better, but um, is used to say that people's cattle are people's cattle are overgrazing and therefore um, ruining the quality of the soil. Mm -hmm. um, or you know these fragmented right these fragmented holdings do not allow people to invest in the quality of their soil, um, or you know cattle wander through um, in ways that again are are um, destructive to crops. Um, so that so that fertility logic comes in there. Um, I don't I have to think more about what to say about it in terms of in terms of standardization beyond what I already said, which is sort of that you know it is clear that an, an acre is not a unit that is helpful for understanding, that isn't that helpful for understanding or for equating different pieces of land, right? Because the question of the, the kind of soil, the quality of the soil, the level of its fertility, but also just what kinds of things can grow there, right? Because different soils are better for different things. Um, that is something, that is a kind of an, an inherent variability, ecological variability that again, contemporary agriculture wants to eradicate right and say like we have fertilizer there's many ways you can make your soil you could just bring soil like you can make yeah. this pile um and um yeah and so we are, there's an effort to abolish that difference yeah and i did see the difference between you have the stage of agricultural land in mumbai that whole that part was completely cut off this land did not grow anything in fact there is the statement that oh, the rice growing on this brackish water is so bad, mm. it has to become urban land. There is no transition mm -hmm. from the sea to identifying as wasteland and then reclaiming it, creating land that can be sold. But there's absolutely, when I was reading yours, I said there is no mention of agriculture at all. Mm. There were people who were doing agriculture, but they said the quality of rice was mm -hmm. awful and we, they, really, they really should stop growing more of them. <laughs> so it was really brackish water. I have a suggestion yeah. for your yeah. tree problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the tree, yeah, got So this tree that is no longer there. Yeah. First, it had to be, I think the thing that's most shocking about it is that if I were to tell you let's meet under the tree, we have no idea what tree. Yeah. So first of all, there was an idea of a tree as a landmark. That And so the destruction of that tree is also in a sense the destruction of that form of knowledge of locating oneself in space. The other thing is that this is a banyan tree, which is, uh, you know, for those of you who've been in Bombay, it's just such a crazy and iconic tree, right? It has these air roots coming down. And I could be wrong about this. Please correct me if I'm wrong. They, the air roots create new trees. Yes, they do. And ecologists actually sometimes call that one tree system. So there were, there's like, so, so you know, you could have like, what might look to me, who is not trained in those ways as not one as you know many trees, but it's one sort of system. And so first you have this sort of system of trees becoming one tree that is identifiable, but then you even lose that kind of ability to recognize a tree as a thing and not just some sort of um you know uh, mass of greenery or or you know something. And so there's something about that kind of shifting and understanding of that object as a known object to and replaced with maybe the Bombay Stock Exchange or whatever it is that we now recognize as the place. It's somewhere in Hornemann Circle. Yeah, somewhere. Well, it, 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 but uh, it also doesn't matter. That's why it dropped yeah. any tree, but for but me, it did. But it did. It did of course. That kind of form of knowledge has shifted. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, it makes me think about this question of why do things change because they do. You know, they do, we cannot locate the change, but they change. But it does so much in the myths, right? I was reading some Bush Nair has this book on the origin of Bombay Stock Exchange, and the tree comes up everywhere, you know, Mythic tree. because they could not enter the building, and that is the That's point. The they could not, the key was they could not trade in uh, the existing architecture or whatever yeah. the buildings that the British. So they have to meet under the tree, very close to the port. And the choice of the tree, there is also a lot written on that. Oh, it was very close to the port where the cotton was circulated. This was in a position there. You can see movement. It is literally a site of transaction. And, and that's where people meet, right, for shade. And I, I like what you said. I never thought about the specificity of the, of the tree. I think they have had a question. I mean, oh, now I can see all that. Oh, 
Okay. Um, so thank you both for these great talks. Um, so you sort of wanted to ask more about practices of naming in the stories that you both tell. Because it seems like uh, in the origin of this uh, making grant A, uh, there's a sort of uh, process uh, in which something is named in a particular way that allows a whole machinery, uh, social, technical, and economic logic to be deployed. Either wasteland versus C or Shamba versus the plot. So I'm sort of curious if you could both say more about how the sort of discursive element interacts with these other levels in this process of making land into something that's valuable, uh, saleable, and as a sort of object of accumulation. Fantastic question. <laughs> um, I mean, I I can, but I also think that you like this exactly with it, just if you could say a little more about this idea of this the weird word reclamation. Yeah. I think that would be a yeah. I was phrasing, I think that comes back to throughout you're right, throughout uh, the history of reclamation, especially this idea of making land and you have to map it. In mapping, you have to name it. And when you name it, you name it in certain ways that are acceptable. And those names get attached to. So at some point, they said drown land and wasteland means this land can be taken over. It is nobody's land. Nobody's building anything there. Uh, and this origin of drowned and wasteland, of course, tra as Brenna Bhandar says, that wasteland itself is an idea that it is a form of, um, it is a way to take land. But the second part of the story that what we're saying about reclamation in my mind, the idea of reclamation itself is trying to find the origin of the word reclaim itself, right? Why is there this attachment to this thing that we're taking land that existed before? There is a question of, there is violence, even in the terminology that they have, right? They're pushing the sea away, they're driving the shallows away. And the question of reclaiming means it existed before. And I think uh, Amiel saw this strange back and forth because there is a question of future that underlies this whole paper, right? There's a question of imagining a city that would be a great city because it's remote and nobody would attack them. Then there is the futures that was traded on, right? That they the, the, the whole reclamation company, the shares were running on land that was never made. So there was the question of future. But also reclaim comes down to this past as though there is that there was land and it was ours and we're just taking it back. Mm -hmm. So um so throughout all of them, there is the question of the future, and there is also this question of acceptable terminology. And um, I see that again in coastal regulations, which I look at. Then shore is shore is worse than bay. I, I don't know <laughs> why. Uh, why is shore requiring five hundred meters, but bay is requiring hundred meters? So yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just just to say a little more mm. about your paper. I think that the reclama the term reclamation is just so fascinating. Yeah. And I was when while you were talking just now, I was really thinking about the way that it naturalizes land as the kind of base, the baseline yes. for what territory is, right? So even though it's actually very clear that land did not pre-exist the sea in that right. in that place, nevertheless, the description of reclamation makes it seem as though we are just sort of getting back what is ours versus in this very adversarial way. Um, against the sea versus like yeah. Yeah, making something new. And I think that's, I just think that there's something, like, I think there's even more you could think about with respect to why that term of getting back versus making new. Yeah. Um, and again, I think there is like, there's something important about the, the like taking it like this very adversarial logic about it. Um, and about the, yeah, about the plot. I mean, I think that's a great question. I think it's actually part of the, the question that I'm really puzzling over right now is, to what extent does it make a difference that this thing is called a plot rather than a shamba? You know, um, like, or, and is it a difference that makes a difference, right? And I think that it is, but I can't. I'm not sure that I fully figured out exactly why. I think that on the one hand, I think that there is people are not everywhere. Like the commodification of land is different in different parts of Kenya. The native reserves have much more um, ancestral land that has never the former native reserves that, ha that has never been marketized, but still commodification of land is not anything new. Right. Um, but I nevertheless think that in order to kind of separate and extract land from a certain set of social relations that are at least ideologized via ancestral connection, even when they're not, I think that the, that the switch of term is important. Like, I think that that's meaningfully important um, in kind of permitting land to become something else. And that's why I think this encoding around size is also important because I think that that the, the kind of an imaginary of something as small 
is significant because there is a lot of resistance to selling to selling land when it's family land. Um, and, and people continually spoke to me in the logic of sort of when they were doing it in logic kind of defending themselves. So, you know, we, we, we need to sell land or an often, and I didn't really talk about this, subdivision is actually not necessarily, it's not really the only way that things are happening. So a lot of, one thing that people do a lot is just sell a small piece of their land, you know, and they'll say something like, you know, what's the point of me sitting here cold and hungry on my land? Let me let this piece circulate, right? <laughs> so a piece, a piece will, a piece will be cut off and circulated. Um, and so I think it, there's also like a slightly different imagination around what that partition is. And I think that the, I think that the word is important, but I'm not totally sure, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, there's, you could describe this in a political economic way without at all mentioning plots. <laughs> and I would like to ask you, when I read your essay, which I mentioned to you, that I was very fascinated that she talks about decomposition, where I use the word transformation, right? And, and when she used decomposition, that you, you say that it becomes from agricultural line, land to real estate, mm -hmm. it's a process of decomposition. Mm -hmm. Could you speak about that? Because but I was very struck by that, the idea of decomposition there. Yeah, I think, I mean, I like I said, I sort of use, use the word not in any sort of very precise technical way, but <laughs> but to indicate to indicate that what what is happening when land becomes plot is not just the sort of dividing of something up into smaller pieces, right? But it is actually the the rupture of a certain set of ideas and meanings and land use practices mm. associated with a particular kind of land that get then like decomposed into this smaller. So that's why yeah. It's a, Coming back to your labels, I'm just remembering that I was comparing the maps and the maps prepared by locals at that point had no labels. Mm. It was the, the water had fish. Um, it was completely different from this very organized, this name means this, and that is attached to some legal acquiring of land. Um, and those maps were very different than stuff. So. Yeah. First of all, thank you. That was fantastic. It's really joy to listen to you both different. And I, if I didn't hear it incorrectly, I will say something about the Google room. <laughs> so I was just wondering if, um, and the word exactitude was used, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that these two um, stories about how land was made is more about constructing legal trends in the name of the family. Um, exactitude. I mean, just in the in the way that the plots are measured and divided and sold and so on, and in the way that you said, cotton um, money was parked in the reclaimed uh, land and then uh, withdrawn when needed and so on. So I just uh, wonder if one way to understand the difference between the imperial uh, imperial uh, capital and the native capital in this case. Is to uh, look at how wiggle room may have worked for the mm -hmm. right? I, I suspect, and the way in which, for example, ancestral uh, law is brought into the place or jurisdictions or liberty and so on. So clearly, wiggle room is not the same for you know, the colon of the white and the black uh, settlers. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm thinking about it right now. <laughs> well, I have thoughts about yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> we met before and yeah. discussed each other's paper. Um, no, but I do. I I really think that the, that there's. I don't know if this is exactly the same thing as wiggle room, but that the the so fact, what exactly is wiggle room? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, when I'm talking about it, I just mean that there's this there's this gap which becomes, I think, commercially significant in in the translation between the different metrics, mm -hmm. and that. Specifically, the translation. I mean, everybody, everybody buying land is told to make sure you look at the the, the hectare, the amount of hectares that's actually on the title deed, because somebody's going to sell this to you as fifty by hundred, and then they're going to write some other kind of decimal number on your title deed, and you know that might actually not align, um, and so you got to really check. And so I think that that is um, that's where I was imagining wiggle room, but more broadly, I mean, I love I love opening it out as a kind of broader. Um, question around sort of what the role of ambiguity and ambivalence plays. And I think that for, you know, the question of what kind of land reclaimed land is and why it is available for speculation, why it is exciting as to think about the future, but also why it why it works in the way that it does historically, right? Um, 
as something which has not yet come into being and which likely will but might not yeah. i think that 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 wiggle room around the sort of yeah the ambivalence of that space between land and sea um the intertidal zone is is really is really interesting to think about even the usage of the word ambiguity, I think I said, it, is it vague, vagueness or mm -hmm. is it, you know, something that is deliberately not, as, as the other geographer said, oh, it's a deliberate misinterpretation yeah. that was made for colonial give and take. And this sort of ambiguity is, is clearly necessary um, to make this, you know, this, this sort of trading in the future as possible, right? That you really don't want to identify these two areas because like like the plan that said oh it really depends upon the vantage point you drew this from mm -hmm. if it's a tidal tidal patterns may mean it's ocean and mm -hmm. that day you will draw ocean there and the day during the monsoons it'll be ocean too mm -hmm. but I, the question of ambiguity and wiggle room is pretty interesting i've not spent mm -hmm. too much time well, there's yeah. some, i mean maybe the opposite is not accuracy but sort of certainty there's definitely certainty that development must be accelerated mm -hmm. the ads um, actually it was i guess the 1950s document that said a plan for accelerating development, no, right? Accelerating subdivision. Intensifying. Intensifying, right. So that's a strategy. And, and in terms of, I mean, your ambiguity is not numerical, it's kind of elemental. Like, yeah. is it cotton or is it a Gothic building? Is it land <laughs> or is it water? But there is a certainty that development will happen, mm -hmm. that speculation will mm -hmm. happen. So it seems like also the wiggle room is nice because there's it's for the sake of something. Mm -hmm. For the sake of, for sure, there will be a, a two-story house or a three-bedroom house in this spot. Yeah, but also, I mean, to come back to this question of the to Reinhold, the initial questioning, also that you know that this is in land that pre-existed, so therefore, the whoever whoever makes it claims it, right? And yeah. that's really important. So, to, so to be able to say, well, we're not really sure what this is, then allows for somebody to okay. yeah. Yeah. an actor yeah. to claim, yeah. it, like okay. in a very clear way, like, well, I created it, you know. So, the question. Yeah, there was one in the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, on this topic of this ambiguous speculation, with um, the kind of wonderful, super complex that you've given us with these ideas of land size, social construction, and their encoding, how could that then be applied to conceptualizing property in the digital space? I apologize for evoking the buzzword, but what does it mean to kind of build and conceptualize land and sort of the metaverse without mm -hmm. decouple from agricultural roots and how might we read political significance and fertility of such territory? Yeah, at level of like ability to answer this sort of that, like I feel like that comes into the, like the what do we do now question. Like, yeah. it's just like, well, um, I, I don't know. Um, I maybe you, but I'm the internet. What's that? Yeah, 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 from the internet. No, I mean, talking I about that, actual like metaverse land. Metaverse land. Yeah, I didn't even know land was sold. Was yeah, yeah, no, this, they're buying and selling everything. Oh, oh, is it? Well, wherever. I don't know. It's a topological problem, right? This is where is it? It's very abstract. It's territory that unhelpful from this kind of just very Yeah, yeah. How would we then conceptualize this idea of like, is there reclamation? Well, creation. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say is that the only, the like only starting place I can sort of think is to do the kind of work that Deepo is doing, right? And to look at the metaphors, right? What metaphors are being used? To 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 bring into being and articulate a claim to this space. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Can, can I just? Okay, oh, I was fill the void for a minute, but <laughs> because just to add to to add to to substitute production for for you know imagination or the other kind of things because somebody's producing this and and uh, you know literally in terms of the. Not just the you know, metaphor of some space out there, but somebody's writing that code, and so that mm -hmm. might be one place to start. Mm -hmm. so, but, uh, um, I have a question for Emil, but maybe to both. I was wondering about the desirability of the sales. Um, like if it comes from other places than just government or uh, companies. But I mean, Emil, in particular, you talked about people. Having kind of like a resignation, like okay, I'll sell if I have to. Um, but I'm wondering if there's something else there about 
you know, the houses that are being built and the desire to form the city and mm -hmm. you know, the class between those two interests, with your with the people that you Mm, you mean from the from the standpoint of the person who is selling their land? Yeah, if it's done in other ways than just like, oh, well, I have to, but mm -hmm. like maybe they, they really want the money, mm -hmm. they really want to build the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the in the longer version of the paper, I, I talk about two particular two particular places, and one of them, the story of this household that I lived with, um, who in the process of, I mean, I yeah, first lived with them about a decade ago, so in the time intervening, um, the patriarch has really shifted from I will never sell my land to gradually selling and selling and selling. Um, and I, the first time it happened, I was so shocked. <laughs> I was really shocked. And uh, But people in the family, because it meant that in this kind of one household compound, which was then subdivided among the three sons and the patriarch, um, that meant that sort of somebody was literally going to be coming and building their own house right in the middle, right in the middle. And that, so I was very surprised, but actually the household, the household took it as kind of, um, as a relief. I think that being so close to your relatives is not always ideal. Is this the alcohol? Yeah. And, and so they like largely, I mean, and it was also the, the, ideological defense was also where we're selling land, but we're also buying more and more land elsewhere. And so, you know, we're not completely giving up on land by doing this. Um, but yeah, I think people really thought thought of it as a kind of belief. So I think there's a, just to say that there are many reasons for which people want to sell land. And I do think that the most common that I've come across is encountering some kind of medical emergency and or school fees. Those two things are what lead to people selling their land the most. Um, but there is, understandably this the social form of the household is not actually that fun a lot of the time and so people want to get out um and so there is there is some there is some desire for this commodification as a means of getting out I remember a question. Um, this yeah, is your I, question I, of production yeah. and in essence the labor question but through uh, other means continuing from last night <laughs> well yes exactly because you yeah. mentioned much earlier um metrics by which uh you know, yeah, metrics which helped, which carried within them a certain type of labor, the, the theater, you know, with the amount of yeah. gender change we have, it's, it's, the gender yeah. change we have, which are basically measured to the amount that a single ox could draw in one day. So there's something about land in this sort of fertility, pre, even a pre imperial phase, where we imagine that it has to be counted in some way through labor. And that gets increasingly detached. But in both of your cases, it sounds like there's so much preparation for markets. And that, on the part of people who are taking out cotton of their, that has to qualify in some way as a type of practice that is then makes land. Mm -hmm. All these people who are somehow preparing, reading on the internet, what is the size of their, watching those videos, mm -hmm. what is the size of my plot exactly? That's labor in some way yeah. before you sell your land. And similarly, you have to pull out, I mean, you didn't talk about it that much, you didn't have so many people, but. There have to be practices that somehow are the equivalent of like a half percent of land. And I don't mean it metaphorically, I mean it in, in terms of preparing a commodity that would make it different than others to, to Reinhold's question. Your, your question kind of is that. I like how yeah. Yeah, certainly that's a dimension, yeah. I don't know. Do so do you see it that way? Is it like kind of work that people are doing that they feel they must, you know, labor away to prepare their assets for they sell? I think absolutely. I don't know that it's that, that it's I think absolutely there's work. There's absolutely work like this very material and very meaningful. Then that's again, this is my interest in the plot. Like I think that's a kind of meaningful work also that people are doing to make it to make the land available. And that means that it's a lot of social work too. It means it's a making. Yeah. It's a making, yeah. Oh uh, is there more? I had one oh, question. Yeah. I had one question for Ramya, which I oh, found in your uh, essay where you say that, you know, forms of sociality that are invested in agricultural land could not disappear, right? Once it's commodified, it continues, it exists, they are reworked. Could you, I, could you speak a little bit about how they coexist, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, this, this socially constructed forms of how you look at land, mm -hmm. they are coexisting or reworked into, you know, even after commodification. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we talked a little bit yeah. about, about land title in particular, and I think that in, in, particularly in the debates around DeSoto and land titling, um, 
that there is sometimes more emphasis put on the impact of land titling. I mean, not merely for its like neoliberal dimensions, but that actually what it means to have title doesn't doesn't mean entirely that you actually have full ownership. So in the case of the same household that I've been talking about, um, every member, or every male adult member of the household who could have land, they had their land through title. Their father gave them the titles when he gave them the land. Um, but nevertheless, he, the patriarch, was the one who oversaw all of the sales, um, including one that I that I talked about, which was a sort of much more of an expulsion of another part of the family. Um, and it didn't matter that they had title. Like he nevertheless, um, he nevertheless oversaw it through these kind of the sort of they called customary, you know, I think that's a tricky term, but customary traditional logics around who is the one who has the right to that land. Um, so I mean the one uh, I don't want to talk too much, but the one thing I'll say is that I think that the importance of title can be overstated. It's not on sort of factual <laughs> the grounds. And to speak about your own, sorry, I'm interrupting. Well, when you were speaking about labor, Lucia, I was thinking I could not find anything about the actual labor of reclamation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? When I was looking at yeah, the Yes, that was the only thing I found where, you know, there is there are these maps that talk about this process through the processes of naming. Then there is these companies that are trading on the futures and there there is this family tree, but there's very little on who were the who was the labor. I mean, where did these reclamation companies are? Were they locals? Were they not? How and the only mm -hmm. acceptance of I mean, only time labor was brought in was when they say, Oh, we need to outsource this risk. That there is too much risk, there's too much labor, there's too much movement of soil, etc. And we need to bring it in. And that is something I've been looking for. I was questioning. There is a lot of labor in creating this land. And it must have been that one photograph is the only one I have. Well, I could also if, for, if the theme is transformation, you could also talk about the labor that in the United States suddenly was no longer uh, you know, picking cotton for this particular. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to be the liberal labor. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we I've come to our end. Thank you so much for coming and for discussing. Thank you, Brian Hope, for responding. Uh, thank you to the Zoom audience for bearing with our security state. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you to all for coming. Bakes and cookies on the way out. <laughs>